die even now. And where there was pain, it's gone. And it's not a momentary thing. Honey, God is working on you. He's going to set you free as you yield yourself and open yourself up to God. My daughter, Micaiah, and when you leave here, many of you that was in pain when you was coming in here, even in your heart, you're going to you check it, and it's going to be gone. Hallelujah. I want you to know rheumatoid arthritis comes from, in, in, in so many instances, I find that uh, they have, are bitter. They're hard. I mean, even born again, supposed to be born again Christian. You saw I changed it. Bitter down on the inside. Carry it for years and years where they've been hurt. And rheumatoid arthritis is associated with unforgiveness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we close the door of our minds, we don't see the clutter, but we see the manifestation. And we see it in how we react. We see it in how we respond. We see it in, in areas of where we begin to have resentment and fear. And it comes when we least expect it. Hallelujah. And when we try to block it out, hallelujah, then that's when that's when the pain comes. That's when we start having to take sleep and feel. I'm going about how you there are many of you in here that don't sleep. I have I have talked to so many people, and they said they couldn't sleep last night, and they don't sleep, hallelujah. And I want you to know, it is not because you got some insomnia. It's all that stuff down in you. You check how you're going to sleep tonight, and you see if this don't make a difference. Why do we need inner healing? Because Satan knows where we're weak. God says in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, if we forgive men their transgressions, the Heavenly Father will also forgive us. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will the Father forgive your trespasses. Our past experiences mold our personality and cause us to act the way that we do. I'm talking about the hurts and wounds and things that we've been through. And it's a proven fact that the things that we hate in our parents are the things that we become. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want you that are in ministry, just a word of wisdom to you. Let me tell you, you are sowing the seeds for the time when it comes that you are going to be in authority. You can be rebellious. You can defame the pastor. You cannot love the people. And I promise you, in the name of Jesus, that when you come to the place where you are in authority, those same people, them seeds are going to grow up they may come in another person, but that's what's going to follow you. I praise the Lord that the pastor that raised me up for seven years, hallelujah, in, in, in the pastorate, hallelujah, to be a pastor. She said, one thing I can say, she was faithful. That is all I've had for 12 years are of people that were faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I, I, I just, that's just a little, that's, that's, that's extra. You don't, you're not charged for that. <laughs> All of us need inner healing to some degree. Being misunderstood, betrayed, let down by someone, even in our childhood. Hallelujah. Painful memories that are there. We need inner healing from fears that we even had as children. Hallelujah. Sometimes uh, we've been alcoholics as children, as young people. Some of us have, uh -huh. the spirit of murder is up on us. You'd be surprised what people have gone through, what they've looked up on, what they've seen, and even what they've heard that affects them down on the inside. We need inner healing because of occurrences before birth or prior to conception. I tell you sometimes there are children that, that are born that are just totally unwanted. They're unwanted in the womb. And when they're born, they're born with that spirit of rejection. And then we grow up and we wonder, well, what in the world is wrong with me? Nobody can find anything that's wrong with us. So what we need to know is that if we can inherit fortune and the natural things of the realm, there are spirits, liabilities of sin that can come down through the spirit realm and can hinder us in our growth. Hallelujah. Now, all of these things that I'm saying may not be you, but you, you hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you. Hallelujah. What's hindering you from going on? What is the, what is the, uh, the rooting of why you don't have no 
joy. Mm. Hallelujah. What is the rooting of why you can't be faithful to God or why you can't grow in the spirit? Hallelujah. Some of us need inner healing due to deep hurts because of who we are. Some of us don't like the way we look. We don't like what the, our ethnicity, you know? We don't, we don't like the gray of our hair or the size of our feet. Glory. I want you to know I'm a big woman and know I need to lose some weight, but I like myself. Amen. I like what God has done. Hallelujah. May not, y'all might not like what you're looking at, but I tell you, I don't have no problem when I look in the mirror. I know I need to lose some weight for my health, but I like what God has done down inside of me. See, y'all don't know me. I come out in the streets robbing and stealing. And if hadn't been for God, would have been to kill somebody. Hallelujah. But I got saved. And I said, God, what kind of testimony would I have if I killed this man? What kind of testimony? And I said, for your testimony's sake in my life, you take him out of here. And God took him out that I don't have that thing on my heart. Hallelujah. Because I'm getting ready to wipe him out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, I want you to know I was the queen of the liars. I was a thief. Come on now. Will steal you blind. <laughs> you think that devil every day, he don't come and try and get me to do something in those areas that is not God. You think he quit? I've been saved for 30 years. And when I got saved, I said, God, if you will see to me now, this day, I will never turn back. Uh, Hallelujah. Uh, praise God. And I want you to know, I had some money. I didn't believe a line for free. <laughs> I had a gift. <laughs> I was gifted. Yeah, I didn't just get no gifts on my face. I had some gifts on the other side, and they was prosperous. Hallelujah. You better know these gifts now, they are prosperous in the spirit. I said, you talk about resolve? I better look down there at the end and know I got a home in glory that I'm working on. But ain't always so glorious here in the ministry. Hallelujah. But I tell you, I get all caught up in God, and it's all right. I'm not complaining. I just want you to know I ain't always been holy. Right. I know y'all thought I had. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us have just felt unwanted in our homes when we grew up. No closeness, no hugging. Hallelujah. We get up in the family of God, we just hug one another. Talk to one another. And we, I ain't never felt the arms of my father. I never remember my mother saying I love you. But I got to tell you one thing. There was never no question. Now, I don't know how it was so, but there was never and even now. There is no question and there never was a question. Hallelujah. But you know, I like all that stuff. And my kids like it. And my grand. Do you know that within the last five years, do you know I've just been able to tell my daughters and my son that I love them? I felt so shame telling the saints that I had to come before the church and tell them. I said, do you know that I don't know when I told my kids that I love them? They grown up 40. My son had a birthday. He's 31, my baby. And my girls are 42 and 43. And I tell everybody I love them. I'm here loving you and got my own kids and wasn't telling them that I love them. Hallelujah. What you think they thought of me? But I tell you, I say, God, show me how. Show me how. You talk about You talk about something feeling strange. I had to go in and repent. Hallelujah. And let God do a work of healing down on the inside because them hurts and wounds that we get ready to get set free from was the thing that kept me from loving my own kids. I loved them, but I couldn't love them in words. I loved them, but didn't know how to hold them. My daughter, biggest, be tired here, girl, let me hold 
church you in before I leave? I said, honey, I love you. Yeah. She don't live nowhere but grandkids. <laughs> my son, nowhere grand. My daughter, that, and guess what happened? One month, they started getting in the conversation. Mm. Mama, I love you. Yeah. That's right. Woo! Yeah, yeah. I, I never even, I wasn't even looking for nothing from them. Yeah. Hallelujah, I was trying to get me straight. Yeah. And why I was willing to let God change me. Yeah, but they on their way. That's just like a man that first thing they do, he holler. 
Sometimes you need healing from memories that play with guilt, condemnation. Sometimes, let me tell you, some of us have had abortions in here. I want you to know that's not the unforgivable sin. Hallelujah. Those things haunt us. Some of us may have had our children taken from us and we don't know where they are. Giving them up for adoption. Hallelujah. Don't know where they are. I want you to know there is peace in the spirit. Hallelujah. How many people have I prayed with where God has united them back together? But their whole uh, childhood, they have been separated. Hallelujah. We need healing for that. Uh, some of the things, we need healing for some things we've been through. I tell you, finances will drive you out of your brain. Oh, y'all don't know about that. Yes, well, I tell you, make you feel hopeless like there is nothing else, like the world is going to end. Hallelujah. Glory. Sometimes we lose loved ones, and we just, we will not let go. We just walk in that sorrow, and we walk in that grief. There is a season that God gives us for grief and sorrow. But when that season is up and we don't let it go, I want you to know that thing turns into a spirit. And God's going to free some of you from grief and sorrow. That thing where your parents passed away when you were young and you grew up without a mother or you grew up with step-parents that abused you. I want you to know that thing is just, you, you know how alpha cells are do down on the inside? And it just be eating you up, hallelujah. And it keeps you from having a natural relationship with your own children because you don't know how to love them because you never felt that thing. And then when God tries to love you and make you believe that he loves you so much that he can forgive you, you can't even receive the forgiveness from God. Hallelujah. God wants you to know that he wants to heal you today of your broken heart. Hallelujah. Of your seared mind. Hallelujah. Of even some of your physical ailments. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So that was just a, that was just one or two folks that need in healing. We need to know we need something. Everybody relax. You take your shoes off, lean back, and I want you to close your eyes. I don't want anybody to open their eyes up until we finish it. To kind of bring you into a closeness with God. Hallelujah. We're going to go down through some categories. And as I go, as we go through them, the Holy Spirit is going to bring some areas of hurt and I want you under your breath. I do not want you to think it in your mind. I want you under your breath to speak to God and say, God, I choose to forgive. And even if you need to talk to him about it. And uh, I'll be able to come and give you some clinics if you need them. Hallelujah. But I want you to just get free with God. Hallelujah. Father God, I just come before you. And Father God, I ask that those ministering angels that you've said it here will come. Uh -huh. Whew, glory. Come and stand with this, your women. Hallelujah. Minister to them. Bring every area of hurt and wound. Hallelujah. To their remembrance. <coughs> and Father God, cause them to experience that as they speak it and give it to you, Lord, that you just take it. You take all the pain from the memory of it. O Rabbi And those that need it, I may have to put a pen in it and come and minister to somebody, hallelujah, to get that thing off of their heart, to help them to get over that mountain. Hallelujah. Now I want us to go all the way back to the first memory that we had. The first thing that you can remember. I don't know whether it's, you know, three, four, five years old. Hallelujah. Kindergarten, some of us can remember kindergarten that far. And then I want you to remember the first time that you were Father God, I pray to 
tears to bring every area of hurt and wound and disappointment to their memory. Right now, in the name of Jesus. The first time you were hurt, I want you to know we're going to go through that father and that mother and those children. Hallelujah. So the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to come up through elementary school. Hallelujah. Where maybe you were abused. Maybe somebody, how you were hurt. You know, sometimes we don't have uh, financially what other kids have. Sometimes because of our size or, or, or who we are or, or what our hair was like. There were kids that talked about us, teased us, and hurt us. Hallelujah. I want you to tell Father God, I just choose to forgive teachers that whipped us, embarrassed us, humiliated us. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Father, I just choose to forgive and call their name. And Father, I pray that you would forgive them. Kids that we had fights with. Now, you do not have to struggle. If the Holy Spirit drops it into your spirit, and it's something small, it's there, and it's something. You bring it up. Hallelujah. And you give it to him. We're going to move on up to junior and senior high school. Hallelujah. I tell you, areas of rejection from kids in school. Teachers that abused us. Hallelujah, teachers that sometimes they would punish us and it wasn't our fault. And just sometimes they would punish us and it would just hurt us. If that thing brings a painful memory, or if that Holy Spirit brings it to your remembrance, anything in school, groups whereby you were rejected from, they didn't want you in it, friends that didn't want, to, that didn't want you around, didn't want you in clubs and groups, hallelujah, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, bring every area of hurt and their remembrance. Hallelujah. Move on up into college. I tell you, now we're going to get into these brothers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But hurts and wounds that occurred when we were in college. People that stole from us when we were in school. Hallelujah. People that abused us, misused us. Father, I choose to forgive. Call that name. And I pray that you would forgive them in the name of Jesus. And as you give it to God, I want you to know that thing is going to dispel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to move on. I want you to go to that man that stole your virginity. He stole it from you. Father God, I just choose to forgive. I want you to give that thing over to God so that you be done with it. Hallelujah. Stole your virginity outside of marriage. Hallelujah. Took that, took that that God gave you for one man. Hallelujah. That's the greatest thing you had to give to a husband. Father, because you commanded me to forgive, I choose to forgive. Hallelujah. And I pray that you will forgive in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now we're going to move to the other men. Every man that violated you outside of marriage. Every man you had sex with outside of marriage. There are some that are major. And you want to put, you want to call their name because there were such hurts and wounds. Hallelujah. Involved with those relationships. But if not, you can put them all in one grouping. Hallelujah. These are areas that will not haunt you anymore. When you see them, you won't be thinking about how they abuse. God's going to take that. Father, I just choose to forgive. Call them names. Hallelujah. Lord, or you can just say, every man that violated me outside of marriage, I choose to forgive. I want you to tell God under your breath. Do not do it in your mind. Do not think it. That enemy needs to hear it. That I'm kicking you to the curb today. You won't be able to use in relationship against me to hurt my heart from now on. Uh, for me to make decisions out of, uh, uh, out, out of my hurts and wounds that I've gone through. Now we want to move on. That one who led you to first time sin. Hallelujah. Lord, I choose to forgive that one called their name who taught me to smoke. Who, <laughs> who gave me my first drink. Who started me out on drugs, supplied me. The first one who told me that I could steal and get away with it, who told me we, would, we could have sex and it would be all right. That first sin, that person that drew you into sin for the first time in any area, God, I just choose to forgive right now. Hallelujah. I ain't the only thief. I ain't the only liar. Hallelujah.
money to somebody to come and say, hey, you can get away with it. Why don't you do this? It'll be financially uh, 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 acceptable for you. Hallelujah. We're going to move on. We're going to move on to uncles and aunts. I'm sorry i got to go so fast and I can't go deep into them. But when we pray the impartation, God's going to pick up. That's going to be a word of knowledge and prophetic that's going to go forth and everybody's going to be ministered to. Hallelujah. Uncles and aunts. Father, I choose to forgive my uncle the way they treated my mother and my father, the way they treated us. Uncles and aunts that we had to go and live with and they treated us Hallelujah, they treated us so poorly. They treated us worse than they treated their own kids. Always talking about our parents. Then there are those uncles, hallelujah, that had sexual incantations toward us. They would look at us a certain way, always rubbing up against us. Their hands found a way. Then there are those uncles that have molested us. Hallelujah. Father, I choose to forgive them right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would forgive them. I give it up. Hallelujah. Aunts, hallelujah, that, that, that abuse our brothers and sisters, talking about them, saying they never amount to nothing, telling you that you wasn't nothing, you wasn't nobody, you was like your mother, you was like your father. Father, today I choose to forgive. Come on with your mouth. I choose to forgive my, my aunt. Every aunt and uncle that has hurt you and wounded you, disappointed you, hallelujah, let you down. I choose to forgive them. Call their name. God, I let it go today. You'll feel some expulsion coming up out of your shoulders and out of your neck. Hallelujah. That's the way those, those spirits come out. Hallelujah. You see, them spirits come to kill and steal. They come to destroy you. Let me tell you, Satan has not come to break your leg or to break your arm. He has come to take your life. He don't mind waiting a few years to get it. Hallelujah. But that's what he's come for. Brothers and sisters, we'll start with brothers. Father God, I just choose to forgive my brother. Call their names out. Father, where ha, they have abused me, misused me, talked bad to me, wouldn't help me. Hallelujah. Abuse my mother and father. Sometimes it hurt us when they hurt other people. Father, I choose to forgive my brothers. Hallelujah. Alcoholics, drug addicts. Brothers, hallelujah, that wouldn't take care of their family. Brothers that abuse their own children. Brothers that are out there homeless and in the streets, won't work. Hallelujah. Just bums on the street. Wouldn't be a brother to me. Older brothers, hallelujah. I choose to forgive my brothers. Hallelujah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Say something. Say something to the camera. Say what? <laughs> yeah. Tanya. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm <laughs> 
Come on, Karen. I know you got something to say. Oh, definitely. <laughs> 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 okay, I want this table to talk. Talk to me. step all over my toes this evening on submitting in marriage. <laughs> and if I was going to say, no, I'm doing all that, all she got to do is call Willie. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say I can begin again with the passion of a child, just right where you are. And I don't know what, where it is, but I know the Bible says, that a, a good man, a righteous man, fall down how many times? And he get up and you keep on. You fall down, you get up. Amen. You fall down, you get up. Because your heart is to do the will of God. Amen. So you can begin again. So don't let the enemy tell you that you can't submit to what these ladies are telling us and go on and be a powerful, mighty woman of God. Amen. You can begin again. Thank you. 
now going that way. All your friends you used to hang with, they're going that way because they have a different lifestyle. They have a different direction you're going in now. So now you're turning and you're saying, I want to go back to my source. And I want to learn how to become what he wants me to do and to be, and that will take submission. So you start the first walk, and you take your first step right here. And what that calls you to do is to gird up the loins of your mind before you get started. And girding up the loins of your mind means that you're going to put a strap on the reproduction of your thoughts. It's your thoughts that get you into the choices that you yeah, made yeah, today. Yeah. So you're going to say, now I willingly yield and give that up to God, that I am going to line my mind up with his mind, get my mind renewed, and get my will lined up with, with his, so that what I desire is going to be what he desires. So you're going to burn up the loins of your mind. This place up here is the battleground. That's where the devil talks to you. And have you ever been in a situation and you get real uptight and you upset and you, you just can't stand it. And then you make your walk with God. He changes your character, changes your nature. And then after a while, you're faced with that same situation. It doesn't bother you. But it's the same situation. What's the change? Up here, your mind changed because you gave more of your heart to him. So we're going to work up the loins of our mind. We're getting ready to take this walk. And we're going to be sober. You're not going to do this just under emotion. Oh, God.
watch me because I don't want you to go to sleep. I want you to hear what I have to say, okay? Now, let's remember when we take this step of submission, I'm just trying to walk this out as a teacher, trying to put a description and demonstrate this description to it so that you can see what it means. Okay, now I'm going to put on these glasses here because these glasses represent the darkness. I can't see. Okay, so here they are. And I'm getting ready to walk because I'm obeying God. I want to become what God wants me to be. And I want to be submissive just as Christ was. And I decided, oh God, I am going to obey you. I am going to not only obey you, but now come to a place where I empty out myself. Because as I talk with you and commune with you, I'm finding out that I can't obey you until I first empty out all that I am, was, and want to be so that I'm an open vessel for you to pour in. I willingly do this. I willingly unfold up myself. I put myself up under your guidance and your hand and your direction, just as Jesus did, who humbled himself when he came from heaven and took off his royal guard so that he could walk the way God desired him to walk, even unto the obedience of the death of the cross. So now I, too, am going to learn that obedience as he did, and he learned obedience by the things he suffered. I know this pathway is going to be a real trauma, Lord, but I'm willing to make it. So I start my first step not knowing where to go. And I have my little stick, and I'm filling something here, and as I go along, and I'm saying, okay, I'm just going directed by your word. And I, what's that? And the Holy Ghost speaks to me because now I found out that as I'm walking this walk of submission, I have a friend called the Holy Ghost who's my guide and my teacher. And as I go along and I don't know what to do, I'm between a rock and a hard place. He's there to talk with me, commune with me, fellowship with me, and show me the direction I should go. So when I hit this rock right here, I said, what's that, Holy Ghost? And the Holy Ghost said, oh, that's just goodness. And I said, goodness? What do I mean with goodness as I'm walking this pathway of submission? He said, let me tell you about goodness, Deborah. Goodness is what God used to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was goodness that subdued the king, the Pharaoh, who was the mightiest man in the earth because his goodness planned out a strategy. And he designed a whole circumstance where the people of God had to be delivered. It was the goodness of God that drove the people of Israel between a rock and a hard place. Wait a minute, let me see that yet. Goodness drove the children of Israel between a rock and a hard place when they got to the Red Sea and they didn't know which way to go. They didn't know how to swim that far or that deep. So they said, oh God, have you forsaken us? Or something like us. <laughs> when you get into some of your marriages and you say, God, I thought this man was saved. And look what he's taking me through. You're between a rock and a hard place. This can't be the Lord my God. But once you desire to go on the road and you know that your God is sovereign, nothing will happen in your life but what God allows. And that's the confidence you must have in your God. If it comes, your way is there for a purpose. If that man is still in your life, he's there for a purpose. And God will not relinquish him out of your life until that which God is trying to impress, express, and put in you is accomplished and finished. So quit fight God about that thing. Just let go and say, okay, God, use me, teach me, do what you have to do that I now come into 
love, word that came out of your mouth that hasn't been out for a long time. <laughs> and then the accuser of the brethren got before God and said, see, but that person's not sanctified. Filth is still in there. And so judgment then had to come from the throne of God because you committed a sin, you disobeyed God. He says, but my daughter, let me tell you what happens when judgment comes to overtake you and bring the judgment for your sin. I stand up in your place and I say, whoa, wait a minute. And when judgment says, no, why should I wait? She sinned. She disobeyed God. She did what I told her not to do. He said, but hey, have you forgotten something? Here's the blood, and the blood is allowed on her for that sin. So I hold up, here's mercy. I hold up judgment until the Holy Ghost keeps working in you to change you, Man. to get another heart out of you, to get another mindset in you. And once you're changed, once you've been made brand new, once the blood has cleansed you, then mercy moves out of the way. And when judgment now comes to judge you for how you treated that sister or that brother, who you thought came and did this, that, and the other to your husband, anyway, when he comes, ain't nothing in you no more. You're all clean. You're covered. So he said, daughter, learn to appreciate goodness. Learn to appreciate mercy. Because they're your friends as you walk along this way. Just pick that up, hope. As you walk along this way of this road of submission. The road of submission isn't an easy one. Because every time you get into a circumstance, you're not going to know what to do. And your first thing of flesh is going to want to do what you think you want to do. But you got to remember, back there, you release that. You cannot respond and react now based on any circumstance, based on how other people are treating you, based on your opinion of the situation, based on getting somebody back because they did you. You relinquish that back there before you agree to take this walk with me. Now, for some of you, that already answered your question about marriage. <laughs> okay? But I'm going to go a step further. Because I know that even though I've told you that, you need a real word, a sure word, that in the midst of that situation, when it happens again, that you will be able to draw from the wells of salvation, draw life from your God in such a way that will empower you to be the woman of God in any situation you stand up to. Can I hear amen to that? All right. Well, let's go on to the word. And I'm going to give you some ensembles. Remember how I said that as you're walking along that pathway, the word comes to give you light? Well, let's look into the word. A real word comes as you are in fellowship with God. A direct word as he's speaking to you in your prayer closet. But also the logos, the written word, is there for you to also receive an example of how to act in different circumstances and situations. The Lord God has given the word to us so that we can learn these things. He didn't mean for it to just say a little story that you learn in the word. He means for those words on that page to become a life-giving source for you. That as you read it, you begin to see and understand. If that could happen to them, the same God who did it for them, who is, who was, and shall be, will enter into my situation today, and I can receive the same victory, and I can be an overcomer, just like they are. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Now, I realize today that there are people here who do not have husbands. We got one of these. Oh, we got one who is just, who was on this. She said, pray, do you, are you married? You want to be? Yeah. She's the only one that said, pray. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We are so in 
involved with the world's picture of what marriage is. That when we get into that fairy tale and that prince, that knight in white armor, begins to be the toilet man, we just don't know what to do. It's because we started off with the wrong mindset. We didn't gird up the loins of our mind to give his opinion and his word concerning the situation. Marriage is a covenant, and it was designed to be for God's purpose, Amen. not for fitting the thrill of the moment. <laughs> but some of us get in it only for thrill, for the pleasure. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But if that is the sole purpose, one day, babe, the thrill will be gone. <laughs> the world. 
wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hand. Say submit. Submit. This is the first time we see this word like this in scripture. Now, let's back up and, and uh, picture this story out in the background of it. Because God has just spoken to her and told her to yield her opinion, to yield her what she wants to do, to subject, place herself under someone else's authority, and to commit to doing this for the rest of her life. When he said submit, he wants her to go into the action of yielding, subjecting, and committing herself to this. Now, how did she get in this predicament? Well, as I look through the scriptures, Hagar, a little Egyptian slave, I assume that she came into the life of Sarai when Abram and Sarai had come from Haran and they were moving out into the Canaan land as God had asked Abram to come and come to a land that you know not and I will bless you. And as they were going throughout the land of Famine King, you know the story, and instead of staying where they were, they chose to go on down into Egypt. I believe it was there that Hagar came into their life because when the Pharaoh saw Sarai, she was a beautiful woman, and he gave to Abram all kind of cattle, ox, men, servant, maid, servant, anything he could ask for, baby. But plagues start plaguing Egypt, and so when Pharaoh, I guess he called the holy men together, they found out that it was because of this woman in his court because she had taken him uh, he had taken her into his little harem. And he was warned, you touch her, everything in this place is going to be a naught. And he asked Abram, why have you done this? And he said, because I knew when you saw her, you were going to want her. So we made an agreement that she would say she's my sister. You lie! No, I didn't lie. She really is my sister. She is my father's daughter, but by another mother. So here he says, get out. Just get out. Take everything I gave you. Just get out. Just get out. Just get out. And he left. And I believe this is where Hagar came into their life. I believe she was just a young little thing, maybe nine or ten years old. Now, this episode happens ten years later as they're in the wilderness, as they're in Canaan. He had been there for about ten years. And so Sarai comes up with this grand idea because she was buried. You know the story. She couldn't have a baby. So now, I don't know where this woman was thinking, but she said, I will let my little Hagar have a baby, because in our Eastern culture, in, when the baby will come out, the woman who wanted the baby, if she stood there and received the baby into her arms, that was the gesture to show, this is now my child. So she gave little Hagar to her husband, out of her mind. Anyway, she said, okay, It's all about tradition and culture. Because we fight that with tooth and nail. We see a little number coming in and we're about, you better get out of here, friend. She said, little number like her. It's all about a mindset. So here it is, this little number. Go in with uh, Abram. And I get Abram didn't fight. And I was like, no, we better not do that. Because she might have promised him a son, and maybe this is the way it was going to be. Because she could have a child. Are we just brilliant in our minds? This was not Abram's idea. This was the woman's idea. See, the woman's idea. We always try to work things to make things happen. And if God doesn't move fast enough, don't we get in there and try to make it happen?
people are sent, the situation is. Because she brought something into the world that was not God's way, nor his will. It was her idea. That's why God placed man, Kona, I know I'm skipping, but I gotta get here. That's why God placed man as the head of the woman. When it first started in the garden, they both had dominion with their own purposes and responsibilities, which they both could do well. Woman was man's counterpart that stood flat-footed in front of him, and she was able to do what the man couldn't. He needed her. He needed that help me. He needed what she could do for him. God had put everything in her that he didn't have so that the job God wanted to be done, she could help get it done. And without her, it couldn't be done. And he had to inform the man, without her, you're not going to make it. Both of you come together because it's not fun for you to be alone. And that woman just went about her business doing what God created her to do. She was in her purpose. She was working to make whatever needed to be done in the garden done. Whatever old Adam needed done, whatever she felt God would be pleased with done, she had that done nature to it. She had that working hand. And in the scriptures, as God had come to Adam and Eve, after they sinned, as you interpret that in the Greek, we find out that she really thought she was doing the best thing for her husband when she got this forbidden fruit. It said surely she didn't feel that it was wrong. She was causing him to come into what God had said, that he would be like him. But trying to do it out of here won't work. She was open to suggestions that were not God's words. And because she followed those suggestions and then tempted her husband to do the same, it threw the whole course off. So God says, because of this man, you are now given the headship. I didn't say domination over the woman. I said headship. Headship means before we make a decision to do anything, you and I, the last word to come out after we have come first talked about it, got each other's angle, what the man then decides will be the ultimate decision. And that is the course we will go on. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> 
so we sit and they go around, that's my baby, my baby, my baby. <laughs> Designed the man to be the head, and you to be 
you to help me. And I have to address you in the point of where you start off our conversation. When you can see that, receive that, walk in that, we can go on from there. All right? Sarah, I mean, uh, Hagar, Sarah's name. Bring it back, brother. Bring it back, baby. Get off your high horse. You're like a new one. Then he says, when came us that? You know how we went into the thing of the black identity? And it says, until you know where you came from, you won't be able to know where you're going. Amen. My sister, little lady, remember where you came from. You were a maidservant in Egypt. That was the life that was destined to you from your mother's womb. Now, because you got pregnant, you're going to come into a whole different place. Now, it wasn't saying that's the way she should be, but she had to remember where she came from. And knowing where she came from would help her to alter her course today. And that's where he says, women, are you going? You've made this decision. Now, where are you going with it? If you get back to Egypt, guess what, Sister Baby? You're still going to be a maid. <laughs> After this dawning comes upon her, the angel looks at her and he says, she speaks to him and she says, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. Now we can deal with some truth. This is the problem. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return. Get back on top. Repent. Change your thinking. Change your mind. Ladies, you got a problem? Today, we can't. I don't care who did it, why they did it, or how many times they did it. God talking to us. And usually in this submission, we talk to both. But right now, God has you here, so he's talking to you. Whatever they have done, now you're on the plate. Return. Come to that place of peace back again with God. Return to thy mistress. Go back straight to the place where the circumstance is happening. Oh, I told you I had to be turned around because we're going to get out of the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. We don't like to hear that. We like to get to where we're not going to hurt no more. But God's not like that. He likes to show you salvation in the midst of a storm. Yeah. So many times he would tell you, get right in the middle of the storm, be still, and know that I'm God, and see the salvation of God work for you in your behalf of what's going on. And submit. Not just go back. He gives her orders to come under the authority of the woman who did what you thought in your mind and more. Now, how many of you would say yes, Lord? If you were the one who had to go back to you with what you thought, when I asked you, what would you do with somebody like that? And not only submit, but commit yourself to a lifetime under that person. That's the kind of submission God is talking to. So if you think God lets you just run away from the hard times, you don't understand submission. He puts you in the midst of the fire because what is he trying to get? The express image of his son in you. Now, look what comes next. I'm going to hurry on through here because i got one big thing I have to take before we stop. After he tells her that, and she's going, whoa, Jesus, oh, He asks you to go back to that man that has moved and has pushed the button and has done this and has done that, comes home drunk. Oh, just name it. He's done it. Oh, God. Just, well, and he tells you to go back and submit. He knows in order for you to do that, grace has to come. Grace comes to reveal Christ. 
effect. When you turn around, draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. And he gave her grace to do what he said in submission. Isn't that good? Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, this lady went back. Let me make a long story short, because there's one other big person I've got to tell you before you can do that. She went back and she submitted. That young boy was 13 years old before he was circumcised by Abel. And after that, a year later, Isaac came. Isaac was weaning, you know, back then they soaked on the breast till they were six years old. And about six or seven years old, they had a weaning part for Isaac. And old Ishmael, now that's, that's what I missed to tell you, wait a minute, Ishmael. The angel told her that the child was going to be called Ishmael. Say Ishmael. Ishmael. You know why God told me that? This is because of your affliction. God called a birthing of someone, of their affliction, of a mother, Ishmael. God sees your affliction. He doesn't tell you to go hide and say it's not really happening, it's not really happening. He even puts a birth upon you to let her know this we're going to mark as your beginning of coming into something you've never had before. And we will call it Ishmael. God sees your affliction. He points and names it. And in it, he's going to cause a resurrection life to come forward for you if you would obey what he tells you to do. She stayed there those 14 years until Ishmael saw the old boy, I believe it was, Isaac trying to pull on that tit again. He had been weaned from it. See, what was he standing about? That's what the weaning party was. He was being weaned, he was coming up to age, they were weaning off the breath, and all oh, Ishmael made fun of him. And that just gets Siri eyed and send him away. Take his mom, take the divorce, and put them out this time. They rhymed me, put them out. Now, the first time, Hagar ran herself. Marriages get so hard, you run out yourself. Isn't God's way? He will tell you every time you return. But if you declare I'm not returning, you won't be. But what you wanted to do in your life, you will never see it materialize, even in that situation. The second time, she gets put out. He puts bread and water on her back. And she goes into the wilderness of Beersheba by herself. Wait a minute now. You just told me if I submit, I get to be like Christ. If I submit, look at Hagar. Hagar got put out. What am I going to happen to me if I submit? When Jesus submits, he, he lowered himself. God exalted him at the end. As you read the scriptures, whenever you submit, there is always going to be a pathway of dying to self, but at the end of the process, there is always an exaltation. Now Jesus' name is above every name. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is the Lord. He's the ruler over heaven and earth and everything in heaven and earth and under the earth, everything living and dead. He's over. All power in heaven and earth is given unto him. Don't try to give us an example of that, that when he went through the hell he went through when it was all over, he got double portion back to it. Oh, they don't try to give us an idea of it when he went through what he went through and almost had his head cut off when he approached God and obeyed God. He got exalted in the rain. Now, I don't see this as exaltation. Just wait on it now. See, that's what happened. We try to go a step above God before we see the whole picture. So here she is. She got the boy. All the food's run out. The water's run out. No more water. You know, after so many days, you got a lot of water. Yeah. This boy at this time, he wasn't a little, it said lad, but lad at that time was like 16 to 20 years old. This boy's about 20 years old. And here they are. She's wandering out of the wilderness. No home. The boy's dying. She put him on her shrub, and she goes over about a boat throw, and she sits there, and she's just hollering, oh, God. Where's the God that he's with? Oh, God, like this. Oh, God, where are you? Where are you? And the voice comes and says, I heard the lad. No, I never understood it. I said, okay, you heard the lad, she was hot. <laughs> but then I start thinking, why didn't you hear the lad? I'm going to tell you why. Because, see, that baby that was in her came out by the word of the Lord. That baby in her was named by the word of the Lord. And that baby in her purpose was called out by God. That his seed shall exceedingly grow, and he should have 12 princes to come out of him. That was the word of the Lord. Say word of the Lord. Word and Lord. God watches over his word to perform it. Nothing in heaven and nothing in earth and nothing under the earth and nothing in hell will stop what God says will happen. So here's this boy. He looks like he's going to die to 
abide. Say arise. Arise. Whatever muck and mire you're in, and some of you aren't married, it may be just a mindset of loneliness. I don't care what, I don't know what you're going through. But whatever you're going through, and you've been tearing and crying, as I sat back there last night, I thought that there's some of you who come here with a heavy heart. Okay? I don't, in this estimate, I can say I don't care, but I do care, but I'm trying to say, I don't care how detrimental the situation is. When you get a word from God to arrive, and everything around you still looks like hell and death, all right, all right, just because God said it, shake yourself up.
characteristic and their way of living. You named them then, you turned around and named the Eve because I gave you that ability. Who did he give it to? He gave it to who? Adam. To Adam, to man. So that when man now in Abram's time got a fresh breath from God and he's standing now as a sword like he should, he says, and by the way, Abram, oh, your wife's name will no longer be Sarai.
Nine of them came. 